The following program is a PodcastOne.com production. From Hollywood, California, by way of the Broken Skull Ranch, this is the Steve Austin Show. Give me a hell yeah. Hell yeah. Now, here's Steve Austin. I've got the greatest professional wrestler who ever graced God's green earth sitting in front of me. His name is Nature Boy Ric Flair. Rick, how are you? I'm great, but I wish you would have sent a helicopter to bring me out here, man. Where are we? <laughs> we're in the middle of nowhere, man. I thought we were riding through Afghanistan like 2005. I'm looking for the troops. Rick piled out, oh. of, his, <laughs> Rick piled out of his Escalade while I go to the driver. He's got sandals on. Yeah, not, not my Escalade. <laughs> a driver who couldn't find this place. Holy cow. How? I like you go, how do you go from L.A. to this? It's easy. It's, uh, it's very relaxing for me to be out here. Do, do you not find this relaxing? I find it relaxing, um, but I tell me what it really means you're in love with your wife, because I could never live with a woman <laughs> confined to something like this, a <laughs> hundred miles from any kind of social life. You really got to be in love, and I'm happy for you. I love it out here. <laughs> to me, this is the greatest place in the world to be. It's beautiful. I can get away from everything, and I dedicate you know two months out of my life to coming down here, mm-hmm. and I won't leave this place. I tell everybody I won't leave, and I, thank you for coming all the way out here. Uh, I, I didn't just, have a choice. <laughs> I, I just figured that you'd have a helicopter or something. Oh, WWE called Nobody me. could drive. Your wife just said she drives two hours to go grocery shopping. And that's a shoot. If you forget a gallon of milk, you go for a week without a gallon of milk. I'm worried about you and your beer. <laughs> I never run out of beer. Okay, I got right. my own beer now. Okay. So I, I never run out of beer. <laughs> this is going to be an interesting conversation because, in my opinion, and most of my peers' opinion, goes to Triple H, to Shawn Michaels, Undertaker, and you on and on and on. That you're the greatest ever to lace up a pair of boots. Thank you. I went back to your autobiography and picked a few facts out that I wanted you to expound upon. Your influences from your early days. Uh, you said in that book you were a black market baby. And mm-hmm. You were adopted. Mm-hmm. What, what did, what, black, black market baby, define that for me. Or did, it means you, I, I was. Did your, uh, did your original parents just drop you off somewhere? No, no. Well, my original parents, I was stolen. In, uh, from but, Memphis, Tennessee? From, from a hospital, yeah, and put in a. Uh, Orphanage, and uh, my original parents I've never met, I've never wanted to. My my mother was a nurse, and my dad was an architect. My I mean, they, they would have been my parents. But my mom and dad adopted me. My dad was in Detroit, and it was really hard back then to adopt as a doctor, long hours, long time, right? And my mother had just uh, lost a baby at birth, so and couldn't have children. So somehow they adopted me, and then I ended up going to Detroit. And then my dad went from Detroit, where he was a resident, to open up practice in uh, Minneapolis. So um, I got to celebrate. To, uh, my birthday was the 25th, and my, they called it my anniversary. was the 18th, so I got to go to any restaurant I wanted to. <laughs> one, day, one day they told me I was adopted, and I was about 10. So, okay, so that's when they smartened you up and, and mm-hmm. let you know what time it was. What did you think about that? How did that affect you as a kid? It didn't. I didn't, didn't think about it. And, uh, you know, I've had, uh, I have an ex-wife that to this day is so mad that I wouldn't go back, you know, saying I'm being selfish because you don't know what your, what, you know, what your family history is, you're going to die. I mean, the idea of heart, you know, I just had no desire to go there. And I, you know, I'm the only one that could open the vault. Right. And I never did it. I had no desire to. My, my mom and dad were great. They, I don't think they understood what they were taking on. Yeah. <laughs> but they put up but with what it. what were they taking on? Because what, what kind of kid were you? I know you were big in the, uh, sports. You were all-state in, in football. You were fourth or fifth in the shot put every year. But were you rambunctious as a kid growing up, a little bit crazy? Well, in ninth grade, I was either going to go to detention school or go into private school. So I had gotten in trouble. No, nothing malicious, riding my motorcycle around the lake, my right. parents out of town, uh, driving my mom and dad's car when I was 14 years old, when they were out driving the other one, out driving my friends around there where I got caught, right? And then... Um, Trying to buy liquor underage, and that was that was time to go to Wisconsin. <laughs> so they put me in a private boarding school, which was uh, and I, I it, it took me a couple of days to figure that out. Kind of like out of there, my other vacation spots that yeah. I talked about. Yeah. <laughs> but once I figured it out, man, I was right there in Wisconsin, and I, all of a sudden, I, the, the kids in private school 
have ways of doing things that are way beyond what they do in public school. I, I wasn't there two days and someone handed me an ID and said I was 18 years old. Yeah. So the way I got over was um, there was a place across the street where, the, where you, we had a, like a break where we could go shoot pool, but none of the kids would go over there because there was a guy, I still got his name, Mickey Minovich, told everybody to stay out of there that he'd kick your ass. I said, what? He said, this kid over here is telling us we can't go, yeah, he He'd already slapped a couple of the guys, and I just said, hey, the guy said, you're, you're, you guys aren't allowed here. I said, says who? And I was already a hero just standing up to him. But in the fight, I said, you know, you can either move out of the way and let us play pool, or I'll kick your ass, and you won't be allowed back in here. Yeah. <laughs> and, of course, the whole place is looking at me, and that was it. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't going to have somebody tell me that I couldn't play pool. Because, you know, they're going to kick my ass or something. So how did you get from this academy to start selling insurance before you got in the business? Uh, because when I came back, I went to the University of Minnesota, and I went there on a scholarship, right? And uh, Football? Yeah, I never got to play. Uh, uh, obviously, I didn't predict a point seven, so the scholarship was gone. Um, I joined a fraternity, and I just stayed in the fraternity for two years. And this guy ran into a bar one night and says, what are you doing? I said, nothing. I was bouncing on the bar. That's where I met Patera, right? And yeah. He said, why don't you sell life insurance? And I said, he said, well, you must know everybody in town. I said, I do. So I just sold all my friends, you know, like about 20 kids, yeah. life in $10,000 policies, right? I was riding high at a brand new Riviera, <laughs> living in a $1,500 a month apartment. And I've never been, I've never understood, uh, but to this day, I have a real hard time with the word, um, no, God. It's, moderation? It's, moderation, thank you. Yeah. And moderation, I just, if I got it, <laughs> we're going. You mentioned meeting Ken Patera. Uh, for the people who don't, don't know, at one time he was the world's strongest man, yes. uh, Olympic lifter. Uh, we lived together, yeah. yeah. And the idea was that if Ken won the gold medal in what she was favored to do in Munich, 72 Olympics, it, he would come back, and Vern was subsidizing him. He'd moved from Portland to uh, Minneapolis, uh, and he was subsidizing him with income that he would promote him as the world's strongest man. And Ken Patera was incredibly strong. Six feet tall, 330 pounds, and he could stand under a basket and dunk the basketball. So was it your idea, his idea, to go join Well, Patera? I know Vern, was, Vern took him, and he yeah. said, why don't you go? And I, I thought... Oh, man, I like it. You know, so we go out there. I mean, I'm 300 pounds. Ken's 330 pounds. First day, Vern's farm, you know. Um, and your place is much nicer than Vern's. Trust me, <laughs> this is just a farm in the middle of nowhere. November. So we got there, and then 500 free squats and 200 push-ups. Well, I mean, it took me two hours. I don't think I ever completed that day. I went home and quit. I said, this isn't wrestling. It's, what do you, what's this? I couldn't even walk. I mean, I hadn't done five, I had never done a free squad. What drew you back? Ganya came over to my house and took me out and threw me out in the front yard of my house. <laughs> he said, you, you quit, you, you, you screwed up in high school, you quit in college, you ain't quitting this. I said, you be there tomorrow? I mean, slap me across the face. Whew. And I, but how, I, how much do you go back and say, man, thank God for Vern Ganya. Yeah, thank for, oh, for God, I say it all Jesus the time. Moment. Yeah, I know, I know. I mean, you know. If he hadn't have done that, yeah. I wouldn't be talking to you right now. No, I know. And I, and I. It taught me, um, it, it, it just, it was, it was an, an incredible experience and, uh, you know, something that made me so conscious of being fit going forward. What were you wrestling under when you first started? My name? Yes. Ric Flair. Ric Flair. Well, I went to Vern. I said, I want to call myself Ramblin' Ricky Rhodes. He said, what? I said, I want to call myself Ramblin' Ricky Rhodes and go as, Dust as Dusty's brother. I said, I asked him. He said, that ain't happening. What's, what's wrong with Ric Flair? And I said, well, that's not my name. He said, it is now. It's not Ric Flair anymore, it's Ric Flair. And, and that was it. And I'm glad you're telling this story because I wanted yeah. to tell your transition from being just yeah. a, a guy who was a wrestler to find your way to being the nature boy Ric Flair, mm -hmm. the guy who had gone on to, to be the greatest world champion in the history of the sport. So okay. that these people, and the, you know, the, the things that I went through as just Steve Williams, Steve Austin, Stunning Steve, Superstar, Ringmaster, Stone Cold, I went through a process. You, you wouldn't think the greatest that, that's ever done it would have to search to find, and we're going to get uh, to those other mm -hmm. pieces as we go. So you go from AWA, and then you go down to Crockett. So was it NWA? What happened? Wahoo left. Yeah. Because George Scott and he were close friends. And so I was just sitting there, and I wasn't making any money. And Wahoo said, George Scott said, you want to come to Carolina? And I said, And George yeah. Scott's booking Carolina. They're booking Carolina. And uh, 
I went to my dad and said, can I borrow $400? My dad said, nope. If you think you're really going to go off on this, my dad and I had, he, he was still wasn't sold on the yeah. pro wrestling. You know what I mean? Far from sold. And so I went to Vern, I said, can I borrow 400 bucks? He said, nope. He said, I don't, I'm not in the business. You, you've got to figure this out. You're going down there, you're going to be a man. So I landed there, and uh, I wrestled Abe Jacobs that night at the Charlotte Coliseum, and I went to see Jimmy Crockett the next day, introduced myself. Well, how I had that night, he said, come on to the office. So I hitchhiked down to the office. And because uh, I didn't have a car, I left it with Leslie. And uh, I said, uh, you know, he said, I'm pretty impressed with you from last night. He said, uh, what can I do to help you get started? I said, well, um, I'm just, I just don't have any money, and I want to bring my family. He said, well, here. Walked into the accountant, came back and handed me a check for two grand. So within a month, I'm making a thousand dollars a week. Okay, you make a thousand dollars a week, but within, but within a month. Within a month, yeah, you're making that, and that's big money. Yeah, but yeah, big special way back in. Yeah, guess what I did? What? I went and bought a Cadillac. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't everybody? I used one. It's okay. Doesn't everybody? Four door Black Fleetwood, brother. I so would. this was the beginning of the nature. Oh yeah, right there. But we're uh, not there yet. A thousand dollars for one week. Oh yeah. <laughs> but before we get there, uh, there Black is, Fleetwood four door baby. <laughs> but but th then uh, devastation happens because there's a plane crash, mm -hmm. and uh, you break your back in three places. Mm -hmm. uh, who lost his life on that? Michael Farkas, the pilot. Michael Farkas, the pilot. And then uh, Valentine yeah. and Bob Brugger is paralyzed. Yeah. Well, Bob got he could walk around a little bit, but uh, Johnny never. I could never walk again, paralyzed. I saw the wreckage of the plane. Yeah, did, did, were you just isn't that amazing seat? that we lived? Did no. you tumble out into the woods or? No, I. I, I my, the only thing that I did right that day was, we always argued because I, you know, the, if you're sitting in the back of a, a Cessna 310, big guys like us, right? Especially the third row, it's claustrophobic. He's right. driving me crazy, and but John's knees were so bad, so John always got to sit up front, right? Well, John didn't have a seatbelt on. When they when they took John out of the out of the plane, he was up to his armpits in the in the uh, dashboard, mm. the cockpit. I mean that was it. He was he didn't have a seatbelt on, which he might it doesn't say it would have made any difference. Right. But you know because the seatbelt actually is what caused my contraction because it held me. But the impact we you know we hit the ground going 230 miles an hour. You know so that that's what the, the speed the speedometer was stuck on. So what, what did they haul you off? In an yeah, they hauled us off, and uh, back then it was the old ambulances, like you know, like in the war, right, where there's three beds. It wasn't a big luxury thing and all that. Yeah. And they said to me, "I've got to hurry. I think we're going to lose this one." And I thought they were talking about me. It was Bob Bruggers had gone into shock. Right. So I grabbed this guy and I go, "Man," I said, "There's a note in my shaving kit, in my bag." I said, "You got to get that. It's to a girl named Sheila." <laughs> 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 yeah, and guess what? <laughs> that story gets even better. You got it. <laughs> Five years later, I was wrestling somewhere, and the guy knocked on the door. I was in Carolina, and the guy said, "There's a guy out here that says that he was at the site of your at the site of your airplane crash, and he's got something you told him to get." I said, "What?" There was a letter. Tell Sheila I love her. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah nice. Huh? <laughs> okay, yeah, uh, yeah. I did, all I need is my wife over up my shaving kit. Yeah, okay, yeah, nice. Not a good thing. She's no. gonna break more bones in your back. <laughs> exactly. So you're in the hospital. You got a broke uh, back in three places. How long did it take you to mend up? Uh, I was back in the ring in eight months. Well, first of all, they told me I'd never wrestle, right? Exactly. Yeah, but this is something that you'll identify with because it's our business, right? So they give me this big back brace, right? And I, and I hadn't been able to get out of bed at home for a month. So I'm going on the office, right? And I feel like everything, oh, God, sympathy, you know. How you doing, Rick, and all that, right? And Crockett paid me the whole time. Wow, well, I still went that's unheard of. $1,000 a week, yep, yep. And... uh so I had a back brace on and all that, and I walk in the office, and George Scott says, what the, what is that, what, yeah. you know, what do you got on? I said, it's the, doc, the back brace I have to wear. I said, take that damn thing off. He said, that's only going to make every other muscle in your body atrophy faster. He said, don't ever let me see you wear that again. Not, hi, how are you? How you doing, kid? Nothing. And this Boom. is coming from a guy George who's God. fucking the territory, yeah. and, and all the guys are self-made doctors, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, they're all sitting there, you know, we've been, and the whole place is going, like, I, I thought everybody's going, oh, hey, Rick, how you doing? Man, man, not a chance. Hey, you okay? Yeah, yeah. nothing. Yeah. 
take that thing off and every, every other muscle in your body will atrophy. It's a true story. But still, I had to stabilize myself yeah. a little bit, according to, according to the doctor, you know. Did you but know you were going to come back to the ring? I did, I did a month and a half later. He said, I can't believe how fast they're healing. Uh, and then when I came back, the, 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 the funny thing was, I mean, it's funny because there was no cell phones in the 70s. But it was a pay phone in our dressing room, right? I had called, I would call him and say, are you sure I can do this? He said, yes. Yeah, I said, but I mean, I, I, just, I couldn't get it. I couldn't run in a turnbuckle, right? And I couldn't take a flat back bump. Right. And so there's George Scott again. He said, you're going to wrestle wood an hour every night until you take a backdrop. Miss wrestling too? Yep. Yeah. And that was a long hour. Farmville, Virginia. I mean, we weren't in front of 20,000 people. And I said, what, well, after about a week of wrestling, Tim, who was a shooter, being stretched, pushed, I mean, whatever, right? I finally just, just whipped me in, I'll take it, and boom, I did it. The Steve Austin Show. The Steve Austin Show. Hey, man, do you own or rent your home? Sure you do. And I bet it can be hard work. You know what's easy? Bundling policies with GEICO. GEICO makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around your home. Go to GEICO.com, get a quote, and see how much you could save. It's GEICO easy. Visit GEICO.com today. That's GEICO.com. But let's talk about getting the nod, because before you before you got the nod, I'm, I'm assuming you had that conversation with George Scott. Maybe after he took, told you to take the back brace off, mm. he says, hey, man, uh, Buddy Rogers kind of oh, reminds yeah, yeah. me of I'm you. Sorry. You kind of remind me of Buddy Rogers. Mm-hmm. And what about kind of losing some of the tie dyed stuff and kind of you know the doing, doing the Nature Boy stuff? Yeah, yeah. Well, so did you fully well, embrace that right off the bat? Because you're thinking, man, I'm jacking the guy's trademark. Uh, no, I never thought like that because I only knew I met Buddy later in life. But Olivia Walker and rest, Johnny Walker and Tim Woods were very close friends, you know, from the days in Georgia. So Olivia and Johnny were in Charlotte, and they had a party at their house. I was at it, Olivia being the woman that made all my ropes, yes. Olivia Walker, who she, God rest in peace. Um, and, she, and she said, I could start making some real fancy stuff. And I said, oh, I know, I like, well, back then, I did the same thing, how much, right? But the, I didn't care. She said, that will make it something really different than anybody else. I said, cause, you know, I said well, that'd be great. So she made me the first one, right? And then, of course, we just kept adding rhinestones and book beads. And, you know, I started out at, like, 3200 for the first one. And then up to, you know, the rest of them were, like, ten, twelve thousand. 12000 And so then you become the nature boy. Yeah. Yeah. So once then, the, once the robes were in place and things started coming, and then I f- was feeling more comfortable with my with my uh, on on the mic skills, you know, where I was talking and getting time, and then the woo thing came from listening to Jerry Lee Lewis. I just started doing woo one day, and look where it is now. But so that ends up uh, you and Dusty Rhodes mm-hmm. in Kansas City. And uh, Dusty had been there a little bit before you. Mm-hmm. Uh, he has the title. Mm-hmm. And they, they decide that they want you as a champion. Mm-hmm. But back in the day, your first title run, uh, you'd been traveling up and down the road. But now you're representing the most coveted belt mm-hmm. in all of the United States, all over the world. Mm-hmm. And so what was your first uh, tour like as the world champion? I was gone, and I was gone nine weeks. But talk to me about your family life because None. You, I think in one of your uh, interviews, I, I, it might have been Megan, she said they saw you seven to ten times a year. I know. That's a shoot? Yeah. So you didn't have a family life? You know, I think everybody looks in life, and I don't think everybody finds it something they're good at. And when I realized that I, I could really be good at this, and I just didn't ever want to be second to anybody. And that, I, mean, I look back in hindsight, was I selfish with my family and all that? Well, here's the deal. Was I selfish? I could either be on the road and be the second best, or I could be on the road and be the best. It wouldn't have made my home life any different, because I've been on the road anyway. Yes. Probably not quite as much 
and traveling as far all the time, like Japan and Australia and New Zealand. That, but I said to myself, well, you're going to be gone. And, it, and Steve, for me, too, the business was always fun. On the road, uh, without the family, what would you do to maintain sanity? <laughs> you're going to get me in trouble. <laughs> You've been in trouble. <laughs> I'm on my fourth uh, marriage. Uh, I don't know which one you're on. Uh, I found my soulmate. Uh, I'm, well, I, well I, I'm, I'm just getting through my fourth. So, uh, man, I, you know what? I just always had, I guess, hanging around Ray Stevens. I learned that there's something going on somewhere, anywhere, and I found it. In Hutchinson, Kansas, after wrestling Mark Romero, not Mark Merrill, but Mark Romero, right? For an hour in a used car parking lot in the rain for an hour, right? I'm going to find somebody and somewhere to drink. <laughs> and I did. The Steve Austin Show. The Steve Austin Show. What do companies like Ring, Hint, and Tacovas all have in common? They all use NetSuite to accelerate their growth. Successful companies know that in order to grow faster, you must have the right tools. If you want to take your company from $2 million to $10 million or $10 million to hundreds of millions in revenue, NetSuite by Oracle gives you the tools to turbocharge your growth. With NetSuite, you get a full picture of your business, finance, inventory, HR, customers, and more. It's everything you need to grow all in one place. Run your entire business from anywhere, even if you're working from home. With NetSuite, you're covered. NetSuite will give you visibility and control you need to make the right decisions and grow with confidence. That's why NetSuite customers grow faster than the S&P 500. NetSuite is the world's number one cloud business system, trusted by more than 20,000 companies. It's the last system you'll ever need. NetSuite. Business grows here. Schedule your free product tour right now and receive your free guide, Six Ways to Run a More Profitable Business, at netsuite.com slash steve. That's netsuite.com slash steve. netsuite.com slash steve. What do you attribute all this greatness to? I mean, can you describe your lifestyle? I got Mercedes Benz, a Lincoln Continental, the Corvette, a Rolls Royce, living in the biggest house on the biggest hill, and I got a limousine sitting out there a mile long with 25 women just dying for me to go. Woo! But but let's go back to when you're really on a roll here, yeah. and you're gonna you're living a gimmick, mm-hmm. and you decide to buy a limousine. Yep. And you got to, you pay a guy twenty five bucks to drive to the town just because twenty five bucks and, and you're know, the, the paper on the side. The, the kid was happy in every town he went to. He worked at the Texaco station. There's people that act like professional wrestlers, yeah. and there's people who are professional yeah. wrestlers. Or you call them sports entertainers. Well, I, I was and in, we're at the Broken Skull Ranch. Yeah. I was in the Raleigh. Yeah. And the governor, um, they put in a, someone a guy said the governor is selling his limousine with a seventy eight Lincoln limousine, tricked out TV inside. The phones where you can talk to the driver up front. I went over and bought it for ten grand, and I, I mean, when I went over in that limo, you talk about heat, man. How much heat did you have with the boys for doing that? Uh, well, the boys that rolled with me loved it. Are you, <laughs> are you kidding? Jack Mulligan loved it. Jack. But and that I was you're ahead of your time, huh? When you you started wearing all the nice clothes yeah. and all the stuff and all the alligator shoes. I mean, the Rolex yeah. watches. Yeah. I mean, you were you were ahead of your time. You know, I buy my clothes at Michael's in Kansas City. Michael's in Kansas City puts it together. So bring the camera in one time. You like it? That's why this sport coat costs $800, and that costs $200. And I don't know what that costs. I'd be ashamed to wear it. My shoes cost more than your house. Really, you had a sense of fashion, and because you looked like a million bucks back in the day. How in the hell did you keep all those suits pressed the way you did and travel with all that stuff? You want to know the truth? Yes, I do. I bought so much clothes. I bought it. I bought it literally. So I tried not to wear the same outfit, and you can look on it on Atlanta TV twice. I believe you. I've seen it. I mean, I, I very rarely are you going to see me wearing the same thing. That's how much money I spent on clothes. What were they thinking at Crockett when you showed up with all this stuff? Because I mean, you're living larger than life, and of course, you're, you're the main guy. You're drawing all the money. Uh, I guess my question is. 
Would you have been able to push the envelope like you did back then in today's system? Yes. You think so? But I would have to be. But, no, first of all, I wouldn't be able to be. I wouldn't be able to to enjoy the evenings as much. But in terms of wrestling, if I if I could bring my gimmick when I was at my heyday to the table right now in Stanford, he he wouldn't have enough money. What's causing all this? Ten pounds of gold around one hell of a body, one hell of a man. I'll tell you what's causing it. Guts, fortitude, dusty roads, something you're very short of. Uh, to talk about getting into the ring with Dusty Rhodes, mm-hmm. Dusty, we just lost Dusty uh, yeah, a few months terrible. ago, and he was a guy that was a huge influence on you. Oh. And me, is growing up, you know, a generation behind life. you, yeah. watching you guys mm-hmm. lock up in the ring, and he'd have you, you'd be calling something, and you'd feed in, and, and I don't know what he'd call it, but when he started doing this yeah. kind of snake yeah. charmer, yeah. and you would just kind of look yeah. at it, wait for the big yeah. atomic elbow, yeah. and i come off my couch to this yeah. day yeah. watching that stuff. Why, yeah. what, what was it about you two guys when you got into the square circle, magic happened, and people bought in. And I'll tell you what, when y'all broke his damn leg yeah. and there in the Omni in yeah. Atlanta, a real heat, yeah. what was it like to do business with the dream? Um, I can't put it into words the best. We we had arguments, don't misunderstand me, um, but um, just a, just a very unusual chemistry. We didn't talk about anything, you know, same thing. And he like the first time he wrestled in, in uh, this was his because this this is a guy supremely confident. Yeah. Who we get going to lock up in Greensboro sold out. He says, just like the opening at Caesar's Palace, kid, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> but it, well, how do you start it, right? Yeah. Because they were that loud. I mean, boom, 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 and and don't you know? Fight, I wrestled Dusty some hour Broadways. I know. People don't give him credit for that. You know, we didn't go like me and Steamboat 100 miles an hour, yeah, yeah. but he didn't ask. He did our Broadways, too. We did a lot of them, probably. I bet we did 100 over all the years. Talk about in Florida, that was Eddie Graham's deal, you know, do the hour, right? So Here, Here's here, the, one, one big thing, uh, promos. Your promo was nothing but supreme confidence. You were, you were the best at everything. You had a better watch, a, better, a bigger car, a fancier shoot, more, more expensive shoes. It was always, you're the guy that had everything better than the next guy. What was what was the genesis for the Ric Flair promo? Because you're one of the best talkers, if not the best, in the history of the business. And and most of it, with respect, was blowing smoke up your own ass and making, you know, that you were the nature boy. Yeah. And no one yeah. knew it more than you. Dusty Rhodes! The world television champion. Our egos ride side by side. He doesn't like me getting ahead. And that hurts me right here for him to get ahead. Well, first of all, with Dusty and I, you have to understand, this is a God's honest truth. I mean, do you know the story about the fur coats, right? No. Okay, we're at the dunes. It's 90 degrees, NWA convention. 90 degrees outside Las Vegas, right? There's a world-famous furrier there, right? So we're with our wives, Michelle and Beth, right? It's 90 degrees. He walks in, and I thought he went inside to get a drink. You know, we're sitting out in the patio or something. I can't remember where we were. He comes walking out, and he's got a full-length, full-length uh, fur coat. I said, where'd you get that? He said, I bought it over there. <laughs> okay, eight grand, right? Yeah, of course. I walk in. He's got a full-length black mink, 12 grand. So, <laughs> okay. Michelle walks in, comes walking out. Three quarter cut, some kind of mink, right? Yeah. Of course, my wife, who thought she was Cleopatra anyway, <laughs> says, "Oh, we'll just put an end to all this." Walks in and comes out with a, a blue fox with a trailer, <laughs> <laughs> forty-two grand. <laughs> if I bought a house, he bought a bigger one. <laughs> if I bought a Mercedes, he bought a bigger one. And we did that this one on for years. It was straight up shoot. Straight You're up shoot. Yeah. yeah. He bought a. I bought a big house, like the first big house I had, like you know, like. 300 grand, and he bought one for about 350 right across the street. <laughs> like this, right? So, <laughs> no, we did it. I mean, he'd get a Mercedes, I'd get a Mercedes, you know? Uh, Tell me about the night that uh, y'all were in the Omni when y'all broke his legs, mm-hmm. and uh, seemingly you were going to maybe come to the good side, and all of a sudden here we comes flipped on him, yeah. Ole, Arn, Tully, yeah. and all you guys, and you Eat. come off on his leg, yeah. and the crowd literally was trying to get yeah. inside that cage yeah. to tear you guys to shreds. We couldn't get out. Poor Sam Houston climbed over the cage. 
We thought he was a mark. Holy, but killed him. <laughs> you know that, right? <laughs> no. Oh yeah, Sam Houston come right over. We, you know, we couldn't tell, right? Yeah, and Sam Houston was, was Jake Snake's half yeah, brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who was in the business? Good worker. Yeah, he came over the top and Holy took him and bam, bam, and iron nailed him one time. And Christ, Christ, he's here. I'm trying to help you, <laughs> poor kid. <laughs> no, they kept us in there for almost an hour. We couldn't get out because they wouldn't let us out. They wouldn't. The cops couldn't get off the ring. How fun was that? I mean, because that's well, it, it was great. And but but it, I, I have been in situations where I thought to myself, this is going to end up like uh, Santa Domingo or, or Puerto Rico, where I have been in real trouble. But it's great to have that kind of heat. Oh yeah, on, on, and, and especially was this a, was back was in a, the day. It was a long walk. Yeah, the Omni back too. That was the biggest problem. Getting the crowd after we got the door open was getting the crowd to open, and we, they just didn't have enough. They ended up bringing in like. Ten more cops. Was there ever any issues when you guys were checking in the hotels and all of a sudden you guys roll in and they're like, oh, Jesus Christ, this is... No, actually, the hotels like this coming in because... Well, because you're part of the yeah. entourage of posse <laughs> that you kind of blasted out. Where yeah. You, yeah. We're going to be at the oh, Marriott yeah. tonight. Marriott, 18 to 28, no boyfriends, no husbands. <laughs> Tell me, tell me about that works for that works for all my marriages. <laughs> so, I've had to bump the group up now from thirty five to forty six. <laughs> so what did you think when you first came into uh, then WWF now WWE? Uh, because it was oh, I was excited. Game. I was excited, man. I, got, I had so many friends up there. I was tired of Jim Hurd, man. I'd cut my hair. Do you know that caused me more anxiety? He he wanted to call me Spartacus. He he wanted he wanted me to wear a diamond earring and call me Spartacus. After years of being nature boy, Rick Flair, I want to call you Kevin smart. Sullivan said, why don't we change Mickey Mantle's number two? Heard said, you don't understand the business. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, you didn't know that? He wanted to call me Spartacus. I uh, cut my hair, with, and I walked to the Charlotte airport, and nobody knew me. I wanted to kill myself. I went in the bathroom. I said, do I look at okay, Nobody knew me. And said, hey, wait, H, woo, 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 nothing, <laughs> zero. Yeah. I cut my hair, I mean, all that hair. Was that an identity crisis? Yes, yes. Did that mess with your head? Yes. On a performance level? Yes. And on a performance level, no. Yeah. No, because the minute I got to WWE, I mean, I, I wasn't concerned. I had no idea they were going to make me the champion. He, he didn't, there was no guarantees with him. He, he just told me I'm going to make you more money and shook my hand. Yes. And then, and then the sad thing is, Iron was leaving and I was coming. So we missed that time together. And... Uh, but he understood why I couldn't stay there anymore. Heard's crazy. But did you feel like you, you were able to go as far out uh, in your first run in WWE than you had been in the, you know, with the Crockett's? Because I didn't, I didn't think that it was quite the same. No, it wasn't because it, number one, the companies run differently. Yeah. Number two, but if you think about it, at the end of the day, while I was here, I wrestled Hogan, Brett, Undertaker, and cause I, under, I got to wrestle Undertaker in house shows. And I wrestled Savage. That's a lot to hell of a lineup to, to work with, right? WrestleMania, got to go to that first time ever. I still, I mean, I had a ball on those European tours, man, traveling with Undertaker and I mean, all those guys. But what about traveling with Bobby Heenan? Oh, the when best. They, they Bobby. put you with Bobby, and Bobby was like, he could do it all. He could yeah. work, he could yeah. manage, he could talk, well, he could commentate. People need to know this. Bobby Heenan, if he had just been a performer, would go down in history as one of the top 20 performers of all time. Bobby could bump and work and talk and everything. But as Bobby got older, you know, they made him my manager when I first came in, right? Yeah. So he goes on one loop with me. You heard the story, right? Yeah, I want you to tell it. Yeah, he goes. So <laughs> we start out in the first loop is L.A., uh, San Francisco, Oakland, right? Back to Phoenix. Um the other weekend and then into the garden while well, I kept Bobby up all night every night and he, we're flying back on the red eye from Phoenix and he's going I hate you I said I wish your hair would I said I wish your hair would fall, grow, fall out and grow back red he gets to the garden he says I don't know where I get these, this kind of reputation he says to Vince if you want someone to travel with Larry Flint find somebody else it ain't me <laughs> I, I hate him I'm never going to go to him again so then uh, you know, that's when Vince put me with Earl Hebner, calm him down, right? I mean, I hear I'm on that. Can you think about this? Now, I'm the world champion, right? Or getting to be yeah. at the WWE, where, I, where I've just come from, where I'm the most, where I'm lowly, di disrespected by Jim Hurd, not by the guys, yeah. but just left in this terrible position, which really messed me up in my self-confidence. I get up here and 
riding down a road with born again Ted one day, next day fixing them up again. <laughs> you know the deal, right? <laughs> I drove Dubia, I was crazy, but Kurt Henning, Terry Taylor was here. I mean, and Sherry Martell, I mean, give me a break. So many nice people. And then Sean was just a kid, just started, but he was up here then and always got along good with Sean. Speaking of Sean Michaels, that brings me to the WrestleMania 24 match that you guys had in which your career was on the line. Mm -hmm. And uh, how emotional were you going into that match? Um, well, the whole thing, and I, and I, since I'm having the opportunity to talk about it, and I've said this, I say this to professional athletes in other sports. I think that my retirement, um, the, the way it was orchestrated, where I wrestled Vince and then there were Randy Orton and all these people were nice enough to do the favor for me in the roadblock to get to Sean, right? And of course, Sean, um, you know, who I, with you, think is probably the greatest in ring performer in the history of our business. So, but to be able to, be inducted in the Hall of Fame. You were there and have unlimited time to talk, even though I got in so much trouble. I just kept talking. And then the wrestle Sean, um, where literally Sean just said to me, um, just said, I said, I just shut your mouth. I don't want to hear one word. Basically pretty easy. It was Sean working with himself and me just there. Um, and of course, afterwards, the response from the crowd was just, I don't think, I don't, how many athletes get to experience that, a time like that? I mean, I don't know of any. I mean, Lou, I've seen Lou Gehrig run out in the field and, my, and all that, but to have that three-day run, and then on top of that, I'm way out of town, they tell me to come over to Raw and do that where everybody comes out. I mean, it was, I was so devastated the next day that I wasn't in the business. I can't tell you, Steve. But you were devastated as soon as they kicked you, because if you go back and you watch the film, you, you get kicked. You go flat on the mat. You're already crying. Yeah. And he jumps on you for the cover. Mm. And then there's some words that, that were said there. It was over. It was over. My F kids Four times, but it was over. And then you went over to ringside, mm. and you, you gave a hug and a kiss to, to each oh, of my kids. Kid. And to me, it was almost like, you know, finally, Dad is coming home. Mm -hmm. How's the transition? Yeah, I just started living vicariously through my kids. Ashley and Reed, everything with them, right? I got, went, didn't miss any of Ashley's sporting events, from gymnastics to volleyball and Reed's wrestling. And, and then I, the company started using me less, and I just don't feel appearances. The, 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 uh, the Mickey Rourke thing, when you got inducted, remember I was instrumental, we came out there with Mickey and all that. And stuff, but it, it, it's just a way of life that's hard to let go of. You, you brought up your son, Reed. Mm -hmm. who passed away several years ago. He was just brought up in a WWE storyline. Mm -hmm. how, how are you with that? Um, I just know that it's very hard for Ashley, emotionally and for me. But I understand the business. And when I ended my critique, I did, you know, I just don't like to see Ashley cry. She's cried enough. And those are real tears when she starts talking about him. When my little brother passed away, you were there for me. I... Oh. I am here today because of him. And that's the only reason to fulfill his dream. And he is, he, he, she went to work every day to do something for him because that's what he always wanted to be. Yeah. And now she has fulfilled his dream. Um, my take on this is, he's sitting up there going, man, they're still talking about me. So I don't worry about what he thinks. I, I think he's going, this is cool, they're still talking about me. I'm, I'm involved, you know, because he's probably driving my mom and dad nuts. You know, he's in time out all the time. So um, I, I get the business. You know, I, I told people I didn't like it when Lawler was wearing out Bret Hart's parents. Yeah. Because it's it's like personal, you know yeah. what I mean? And yeah. even though Brett's family I've asked Brett, his mom and dad loved it, you know, it was Yeah, I, it's emotional, but I, I don't I don't blame anybody for it. And I and the thing that uh, I have since found out is as you said, yeah. The Steve Austin Show. The Steve Austin Show.
Hey, man, do you own or rent your home? Sure you do, and I bet it can be hard work. You know what's easy? Bundling policies with GEICO. GEICO makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around your home. Go to GEICO.com, get a quote, and see how much you could save. It's GEICO easy. Visit GEICO.com today. That's GEICO.com. How proud of her are you? Um, well, people ask me this all the time, and her being in the positions and now in the day she won the title in Houston at Night of Champions um, was the biggest thing that ever happened in my career. Was well, her she, winning? Yeah, her winning that. Maybe, yep, that meant prior to that it would have been Sean, and when I retired in the Hall of Fame and all that in one weekend. But and I've had some great, you know, Starcade with Harley. I mean, there's a lot of big moments. But by far away, her winning that that night, um, considering what's gone on in her personal life and uh, and mine as well, and the loss and all that, it was the biggest night of my career. What That's is, how much it meant to me. Is is uh, being the daughter of Ric Flair uh, a pro or a con for her? There's good and bad with that? Uh, well, here's the deal. I, I never even called anybody to get her in. Johnny Ace walked up to her in Miami in 2012 at the Hall of Fame induction of the Horseman. I had brought her and Reed there, and uh, he said, why aren't you wrestling? He's known her forever, and she had just graduated from college. She was personal training, and she said, I don't know, and she walked over to me, and she think I could do that? I said, yeah. I said, it's a big commitment of your time. Well, that was in uh, April, and uh, in July she was in Tampa. <laughs> One of the things when I see her, I mean, she reminds me a lot of uh, of you, mm-hmm. but she carries herself with uh, this this uh, uh, dignity, this mm-hmm. class, this co- mm-hmm. composure, and an alpha female. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like she has pressure on her because she is your daughter? She has. To I think she her. did. I don't anymore because I think that people realize that she, she is she's a better athlete than I ever was. She's a, a level nine gymnast, and all that stuff now has paid off. And she's five eleven and weighs one hundred fifty five pounds. And she ain't afraid of anything. But trust me, <laughs> that, that going back and forth with Rhonda, they tweet, right? You know, and I tell people, if you let her go train with somebody that can teach her for a year, she's not afraid of her. And that's yeah. the biggest part of it. <laughs> she ain't afraid of anything. So, yeah. I've heard it said a million times, Ric Flair, arguably the greatest of all time. Well, I'm still waiting to hear the argument against Rick is the greatest of all time. And I don't think that I'll ever hear it because, quite frankly, I don't think that there is one. You know, like I'm saying, a lot of guys consider you to be the best ever. Triple H is one of those people. He was a huge fan of yours coming up. You were, you were uh, his everything, his idol. And so all these years later, what are your thoughts on him and, and how, what has your relationship been like with him? Uh, well, you know, I talked to him yesterday and I, talk, I know he's so busy you now, but... He actually is my best friend. He and I got so close in that period of time. And uh, he, um, you know, bringing up a sad note, when Reed died, the first person I called was on her. Yeah. I mean, that's how close. Because he's knowing the kids, of course, and now he was so hands-on with Ashley, you know, at a very difficult time. Because it, that happened when she had just gone to Tampa. It was... Uh, uh, Good Friday of, thir- of 13, so um, I just I can't say enough good about him. I mean, he, he, he's in a tough spot sometimes because he's working for a tough guy. But I don't think for one second that he has become insensitive. Um, I think that he, you know, tries to make light of things because he's the kind of guy that's he's pretty witty, as you know, can be yeah. funny. Um, but he's a sincere guy, and... Uh, I mean, I, it's when I say I, I looked, I looked at him. I said, I'm, I'm not crazy about her doing this, but I know that you'll take care of her, and that's that's saying a lot. To me, I love what uh, he's done with NXT down oh. there. It's it's very simple. It's very organic. Mm-hmm. It's straightforward. Mm-hmm. And to me, man, that's what the business is all about. Yeah. It's not rocket science. It's totally different I think than all. He's, he's really. He stripped it down to the bare mm-hmm. basics of what you need, and you got to have those emotions. You have to care about the people mm-hmm. that are uh, performing, but you know, something less is more, yeah. and simple is better. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what he's done. Oh, it, it, it's, it's what he's done all the way. And I, I, I'm just 
if you think about it now, you know, what he did is Vince finally came in San Jose to see the show. And Vince got on board. And Ashley was wrestling Sasha that night. Or Charlotte was wrestling Sasha. They tore it down. And uh, Sean walked up to, uh, to my daughter and, and to Sasha and said, if I'm a guy in this roster, I'm going to get it together because you guys are better than they are. I said the same thing. I watched uh, Sasha wrestle Bailey, yeah. also uh, Charlotte uh, versus Bailey, yeah. and Charlotte versus Sasha. And I said, man, these are guys. These are matches. Yeah, that, for guys. If the guys in the, in the back ain't watching yeah. this, yeah. because it's not about going 100 miles an hour yeah. doing a bunch of Supercross stuff. Yeah. Man, it, it was. Uh, yeah. They're out there telling a great story. Yeah. They're working with real and, heat and getting time and getting time. Yeah, yeah. So, 18 minutes. I mean, swig of water whole, for, the, for the NXT yeah. movement, and yeah. hopefully they keep yeah. going down the road they're going. Yeah. But I think his legacy is set. He's going to be, you know, because if you look at this, and this is very important too, uh, this is a regular week for him, or, or was, okay? Pay-per-view, Raw, SmackDown, and then on Tuesday night when Tough Enough was on, um, they were going right to that. Vince, everyone too, right? Or then NXT. So he's got a beautiful family, three beautiful daughters. Stephanie couldn't be sweeter, but his time... You know, when he's in up in Stanford, Vince has got him in that damn office. Yeah. So yeah, right. uh, it's a lot. Yeah, that's a whole other podcast. To balance all that, yeah. yeah. But he's doing it. He's doing a good yeah, job. Doing a great job. Let's talk about Vince for a second. What's what's your relationship been like with Vince from uh, when you first met him to where you're at now? Oh God, I, I you know, here's another point. I, I can't say anything bad about him. I mean, he's treated me like gold. I mean, I'm, if he hadn't brought me back here, let's just say that when WCW folded, right? What if I never came back out? Look, look what we wouldn't be talking about half the stuff we talked about. Yeah. Wrestling, Sean, Hunter, Undertaker, everybody, Undertaker. Undertaker, all this stuff, right? So um, that meant the world to me. He's always been there. When I've uh, had financial woes through my divorces, he's lent me money, but I have paid him back. So that, I think he sometimes, he has, I mean, one time I was into him for $800,000, 800 grand. He said, I, haven't let my, I wouldn't lend my kid this kind of money. But I got my WrestleMania check from Sean. I won't tell you what it was. It was a lot. Yeah. Biggest paycheck I ever got in my life, right? <laughs> For deposit only, I handed it back to him. And he, he must have, because he called me. He said, if you want me to, if you want to, you know, if you want me to write this off, I, I won't hold it against you. In other words, if I want to go bankrupt. Right. I won't hold it against you. I said, no, I'll pay back. And I paid him back every dime. Interest, no, no interest. Man. But 800 grand is a lot of money. Phantom income with a government, man. That key, key doesn't work. But, but tell me if you'd agree with this. I always tell everybody, and I've had uh, you know good times and bad times with, with Vince, and I always tell everybody, I love working with a guy, and I learned more of working with him than I did in college. But the thing I like most about Vince, other than his work ethic, when he shakes your hand, when he looks you in the eye, yeah. and tells you something's going to be done, yeah. it is done. You oh, know, yeah. get a piece of paper. Now he's a man of his word. Yeah. You're not an 80s heel anymore. 80s heels don't work in this business. You go over there and figure out what you're doing. I want to, you go watch that match. You go to the cafeteria right now, watch that match. Malenko, you go with him and then come back and tell me why you get slammed off a top rope every night. Come back and tell me. Go watch it. <laughs> you walk to that curtain and you, you, if I know I've had a good match, I just didn't even look at him. <laughs> but if I know there's something that he didn't like, I can't like peek through the hole. What's up, boss? See what he's doing. If he's either texting or talking or looking or going, <laughs> hey, hey, that. <laughs> I worked with Kurt Angle. I think it was San Jose or San Diego somewhere. I thought we tore the house down. It was a big pay per view. Yeah. And he didn't like it at all. Yeah. And let me know he didn't like it. Yeah. And so sometimes you have those come to Jesus meetings with him. But, but at the end of the day, he, all, he, all he wants is the best you got. Yeah. And at the end of the day, that's what he gives you the best. He's got. He's a man of his, his word. A man of his word. You can't ask for any more. I mean, no, you that can't. Is it. In, in this world, in the world of big business, he shakes your hand. And I'll tell you something else he wouldn't do. He's had to slow it down a little bit now, but he would never ask you or me or anybody else to do something that he wouldn't do. Oh, I said it time and time again because I bust his ass on steel chairs and bumps off yeah. the cage. That was his yeah. idea. I, I've, I've always said that about the guy. So anyway, swig a beer. The, the, the run with you and him, are you jumping on top of him? I mean, we're sitting down here. I'm going, 
I'm going, I don't think WCW realizes that they ain't going to be open much longer. I was cheering. I was going, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that being said, I wish, I wish, the, I don't know, I think I wish the Monday Night Wars would have ended different. I wish uh, WCW would have kept running and, and maybe we didn't buy it because I believe there's the, 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 this, this world is better with competition and I don't consider any other commodity a viable no. competition. Well, the thing with those is you, it's easy for you to sit up here and say you wish you to, to work there. You, you would have, you would have gone out of your mind yeah. because you're up here with a professional guy where there's a game plan that starts WrestleMania the day after WrestleMania. Down there, guys get there at 5 o'clock. The show starts live at 8. Nobody knows what's going on. Four different camps, Hall, Nash, Sting, Luger, Flair Iron, our camp was just trying to figure out a way to get to the bar and get away from the insanity. I mean, it's just... <laughs> yeah. And, and, and then Hogan and, and Savage. Yeah. You know? And it was just in the way to run a business. And once you've been up here and experience that, like I had been, and you were here, right? I mean, you think Stone Cold Steve Austin could have survived and that, you would have wanted to kill everybody. You, I ended up in the right day. place at the right time. I got, I'm yeah. so thankful for Eric Bischoff firing me, and I would have never got this opportunity to stop by Philadelphia with ECW, have a cup of coffee, yeah. have a good come to Jesus meeting with Paul Heyman, teach mm -hmm. me how to cut a promo, and then off the sunset into mm -hmm. WWE. He would have bad gimmick, turned it around, and had a hell of a run, but... Anyway, uh, I've been hearing you've been doing some voiceover work for an animated show that's going to be on WWE Network called Camp WWE. What is this all about? It's in the it's in uh, it's very similar to a lot of the animated TV shows now. Voiceover, yeah, and the characters um, Rock and John Cena, and I think like Vince and I are in the role of people that are giving advice and trying to keep everything on board. It's very good though and very entertaining. And all the years that you did the business, all of a sudden a sh uh, show like this comes out. Would you have ever expected it back in the day? No. In Greensboro, North Carolina, no. in a cage? Never. As a matter of fact, I would have never, which I think, I don't know whether it's good or bad, but the whole network, right, you don't understand what life that gives a guy like me. I'm on that thing in 10 different episodes. The only thing I'm not on, and thank God I'm on your thing because your damn podcast it's got all the spaces going, continuing, and then recommended. Thank God I'm on this. This means Lesnar will be gone. It'll be you and me. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> but I'm going to check out uh, Camp WWE just to hear this life changing advice. advice call me, okay. okay. I'm going to call you off the record. <laughs> okay. Uh, but before, I, uh, before we go, we're going to wrap this thing up. No, uh, but you got, a, you got a favorite story? Oh, God. Um, if you really want to know what I was all about, is in 1986, I rented, because I really thought I was a big shot then, I rented a, a suite on top of Cedar's Palace, 4000 bucks, right, just for the suite, it was 86. It was me, JJ, Tully Blanchard, and the pilots. So I called downstairs and I said, hey, we need some entertainment, right? So about an hour later, I opened the door, and I thought it was three maids. So I called back downstairs, the guy, and I go, Danny, that you know, was the guy's name, I knew him, I don't know why. Still remember that, I said, Danny, pretend like you're talking to old blue eyes, okay? Yeah. Pretend this is Frank Sinatra. Yeah. Send me what I'm talking about. Hour later, holy cow, man to the ATM, a thousand apiece. <laughs> so I had a big, in my hand, we had a big hot tub with a curtain around it. Ordered Caesar's, I ordered Dom Perignon, Caesar salad, JJ ate, poured the champagne. <laughs> the pilots were not, tub. are you kidding me? <laughs> Next day, 11 grand. <laughs> That's all I can say. I want all the women headed to Florida to remember you don't have to go to Disney World to find Space Mountain. Every time I turn around, there's a pair of bodacious tatas in my face. When you get on Space Mountain, you'll be like this. As I said at the beginning of the podcast, I consider you to be the greatest professional wrestler in the history of the business. Uh, what are your thoughts on your legacy that you left behind as a person that did work in a squared circle? Um, you know, I don't dwell on that because it's like, I, like I said at my, at my Hall of Fame induction, to me, everybody's got a different deal. If I'm looking at the business, 
the biggest star in the history of our business is you. It's not even arguable, okay? I said it at my Hall of Fame induction. So tired of hearing about Hulk being the biggest star. Because when you, when, when Vince McMahon inducted you and he started running those numbers, and he knows the numbers of what you drew, what you meant to the company, and basically what you brought to this attitude thing, which they've still not gotten over. With me, I, I would like to be remembered as a guy that worked the hardest, because I do think I worked harder than anybody, and as a guy that wrestled everybody. I mean, I did, I, from Brody to Hanson to Steve Austin, Jack Briscoe, Dory, I mean, how many people can say they did that in their lifetime? And then I, later on, Sean, Hunter, Undertaker, the only guy I've never wrestled in a single match, that, I mean, that was there when I retired, is John Cena. But I mean, no. Randy Orton, I mean, like, look at who I wrestled, Piper, Hogan, I mean, I didn't miss anybody. And I had a good time. Hey, man, thank you for coming out here to the thank Bubba Skull Ranch. Honored. I appreciate it. It's a memory. I'm going to go outside and take a picture of this. I'm going to post it on Facebook. Absolutely. This is the Broken Skull Ranch, owned by Steve Austin. The helicopter pad you can't see, it's over here. <laughs> and I've the had 500-acre, the 500 herd cattle over here on the other side of the barn. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, happily out here in the middle of absolutely nowhere. Well, when you don't answer the phone when I'm texting, I know why. There's no signal. Yeah, no. <laughs> you got to have AT&T out here. Is that by design? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks for coming out. Thank you. A lot of this has been a Podcast One production. Download new episodes of The Steve Austin Show every Tuesday at PodcastOne.com. That's PodcastONE.com.